Hey everybody, I am joined again by the wonderful Dr. Alexa Altman. She is a trauma specialist and a psychologist. Anything else that I'm missing? What else do you do? So, yes, I'm a clinical psychologist specializing in trauma and trauma that includes childhood trauma, adult trauma, um, any overwhelming life event. Yeah. That all us humans go through. And I did a series with Alexa a while back. If you're a new viewer, I encourage you to check those out. I'll link them in the description. We did a whole trauma series. But today I brought Alexa on specifically to talk about childhood trauma and kind of the ramifications as it could follow us through our lives or in our family. Like if we have children, do we pass that trauma on? And so I think the first way I want to start is just defining trauma or how do we know if we've been traumatized? There's a lot of different words people use and I hear from many of you that you don't always know what that means or how do we know if that's happened to us? Right, so trauma is defined by an overwhelming event that overwhelms our capacity to cope. So it's really subjective. So mm -hmm. what might be traumatizing for one person might not necessarily be traumatizing for another. And sometimes people will ask me, well, what's the difference between trauma and stress? Because stress is a good thing, and we need to have stress. Yeah, it's in our like lives. motivating, right? Right, to and some it, to some, some extent. extent. Yeah, right. Like unless it surpasses mm -hmm. that capacity, but then when it's an accumulation of stress, it can become really toxic. Oh, true, because it's overwhelming our system. Right. I love the Inside Out. I use the movie Inside Out as an analogy all the time. If you guys remember, they put marbles together, and memories are marbles. And that's why I like the like overwhelm for our system, because the marble can't be put together, and it can't be rolled away. It almost like shatters on the floor. And I think that's why it is so subjective, and why we can have a sibling that grows up with us in the same exact mm -hmm. you know, environment, yet we are traumatized and they aren't. Right, and I read somewhere that cortisol, which is that stress hormone, hormone mm -hmm. when we're experiencing stress or trauma, it's life in the system where it's not toxic is like 30 seconds. Oh, wow. Like the, the, the idea that we're supposed to have an experience of stress and then physiologically release it. Yeah. But if you think about it, if we kind of keep accumulating it and it overwhelms the system, it has not just mental health outcomes that are really negative, but also physical, Yeah, well, our immune system shuts down. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because I remember back in our, in our old videos, I'd done some research about Peter Levine mm -hmm. and the somatic experiencing and how animals like shake it off, like they get stressed and then they shake it off. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's why the cortisol is supposed to hit and right. then come down. We're supposed to like shake it off. We're supposed to shake it off or we're supposed to protect or defend ourselves. Yeah, fight, flight, fight, or, freeze. or freeze. So I think about sometimes if there was a bear and then we'd have that in intense stress response to hopefully fully not fight the bear. Mm -hmm. But what if that bear is a parent and that bear comes home every day? Yeah. Right? And so every day you're preparing. Yeah, to... you're getting that hit. Right. And living in a chronic state of fear. Yeah. And what does that do? So as a child, let's say that's happening to us, okay, and we're in a constant state of fear. Mm -hmm. um, how, if we don't treat it early, mm -hmm. how does that affect us as we grow up? Well, I think that there's a pivotal study, which I'll talk about mm -hmm. in a little bit, um, but what the research shows is that when all of our resources are going towards survival, mm -hmm. which is really the limbic system, which is the survival part of the brain, if we think about like blood flow and all of the nutrients in the brain go into that part to protect ourselves, then there's less blood flow for connection. Yeah. For planning, for learning, for education. So you think about a person that's in chronic state of fear and then they're in a classroom, how receptive are they to take in new information? Probably not much. Not very receptive. Yeah. yeah, because essentially it's like our because our bodies are adaptive for better for worse, right? Mm -hmm. They're there to help us survive. Yeah. Like I've learned that with eating disorder treatment, mm -hmm. the reason that people, and I know any of you who are recovering hate this, but when you regain weight, you gain it around your middle because your body's like, I need to protect my vital organs. Mm -hmm. And our bodies adapt to protect us, to keep us alive. And essentially learning isn't as important as survival. Exactly. Anything. I feel like survival yeah. trumps everything. Yes, it's the it's like just the bare bones of what we need to do. Exactly. I think too that when we think about, well, if you're in a constant state of survival, what's adaptive then is, well, then I have to learn how to, not always in an adaptive way, regulate that state through alcohol, drugs, mm -hmm. cutting, whatever that might be. So if you think about it, I'm like, it is an ad adaptive strategy yeah. in some ways with long-term implications that are really negative. Yeah. yeah, and so so if it's affecting our ability to learn, our ability to connect with others, um, 
I'm assuming that then, then even if our children aren't traumatized by something we have done, is there a way that we interact with potentially our children or mm -hmm. other members of our family that would create that in them? Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. a trickle down generationally? Mm -hmm. So the, the research is fairly new in this where they're showing that our trauma actually is passed down through the genes. Oh, interesting. So, you know, we pass on our DNA mm -hmm. and then there's something called the epigenome, which sits on the DNA strand and it can either turn on or off the expression of a gene. Mm -hmm. So if you've, they did this study and I just think it's really interesting where they had these rats and they conditioned the rats to be afraid of the smell of cherries. Oh, interesting. Which, I mean, ethically, we could go on about yeah, how that's but not That's good. what we're talking, yeah, it's just. And I have my own reactions to that, but that, so the, the adult rats were afraid of the smell of cherries, right? And their offspring, and their offspring's offspring were also afraid of the smell of cherries, but they were reared separately. So it wasn't a learned behavior, right? Oh, so there was no way they learned it. Yeah, they didn't see them be afraid. afraid. They it just, was genetic. It was passed on. Wow. So you can think about racism. You can think yeah. about genocide. You can think about those things that we don't, we know happen maybe to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. But we have a fear response that yeah. we might not know where it originates from. Which is really important, I think, for understanding of people because a lot of people, especially when we talk about other issues, not just trauma, but generational trauma. Like if, yeah, like if your family's Jewish and you had family members that were in, you know, part of, or in a concentration camp, let's say, it doesn't matter that it didn't happen to you. It's like technically in your DNA. Correct. And it's not, Wow. it's, it, it can sound like a devastating tale when you think about it that way. Of course. Right? You're like, we can't escape. <laughs> we can't escape years and years of, um, you know, generational trauma. So if you, if we think about, well, if the genome expresses trauma, it can also express resilience too. Of course. Yeah. And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about the resilience factors, but so when we think about our behaviors today are affecting the f next two, three, four generations, it makes you think twice about your next move, right? Yeah. And who and how you're affecting. Totally. Because if you, if you know that you're passing it on, not through behaviors, because most of parenting, I think, focuses on behaviors. Right. How do you discipline a child without traumatizing them? Mm -hmm. How do you communicate with your child to teach them to properly communicate how they yeah. feel? But more than that, it's like, how do I feel? How do I act on my own, separate from being a mother or a father? Correct. Wow. Right. I mean, it's a lot to think about and process and take responsibility for if there's yeah. an action to be taken to kind of really work and clean up what we can yeah. in our own selves, if you will. There was this groundbreaking study in 1997. It really changed the way we think about childhood trauma. It's called the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Events, Experiences, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, by Vincent Felitti. And it involved 17,000 adults. I think the average age was like 50. And these were adults at middle class, college, I think 80% were college educated. And what he did was he assessed for their, ch their adverse childhood experiences. He had 10 categories. So they looked at physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, um, illicit drug use in the home, domestic violence, um, incarceration. Um, there were a few more other childhood categories. And so they rated how many events, not how many in each category, but how many categories did each person have. And what they showed what was that if a person had even two adverse childhood experiences, their rates for depression, suicidality, drug mm -hmm. use were exponentially higher. And yeah. the statistic that really blew them away is that if, they, if a person had six um, ACE scores, they were, f I mean, this is a staggering number, 40,000 times greater to have a likelihood of suicide. Wow. That basically, I mean, you don't hear statistics like that. No, and people don't talk about it enough because this came out a while ago. Right. So it's not like it's, I mean, it, it's, it is new information, but it's not brand new. It's not like 2018. This right. just got, you know. Right, and so. shifting life expectancy by 10, 15 years. Yeah. So it's wow. not, you know, we can think about mental health and the epidemic really in our healthcare system with these kids 
that are going to, and then we have, an, and then of course, then their offspring mm -hmm. that are impacted by their childhood trauma. Wow, that's those are staggering statistics and staggering numbers. And I know when that study came out, myself, I was, I was, I didn't even have words to describe. Like it was so shocking to me. So if someone does have, well, I guess back, going back to our original conversation about like how we define it. How does someone assess or how do we know if there are ACEs, right? You're talking about having those ACE scores, mm -hmm. having one, two, at least two. We see like physical and generational ramifications. How do we assess those or how do we know? Right, because it is not necessarily like a child's going to tell you. Yeah. And more often I think what you see is in the maladaptive behaviors, which is the kid acting out at school. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're um, hyperactive. Perhaps the coach sees an attitude yeah. that's being thrown or out. Extra aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That in a way, if you think about it, it those all of those behaviors are adaptive in the sense of a kid who's probably running on fear a lot of yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And essentially, if they're struggling in school, like we talk going back to what we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. they don't have any time to focus on learning. Right. Because they're in fight, flight, or freeze. Right. And, and, and our ability to regulate our emotions yeah. is really tapped out because that is really regulated by more of the frontal part of the brain, not the survival part of the brain. So if you think about it, that part of their system is not really online. Yeah, because mm -hmm. they have no energy to put into that. Exactly. So you're going to see all of that acting out as I say, like, it's really a call for help. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes those kids, understandably, rules and boundaries are important, get punished without that intervention on the, in the home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and that's what was really, uh, my brain automatically went there where I'm like, wow. So the, they're trying, they're like screaming for help. Mm -hmm. And instead of helping them, we're like, no, no, you're bad. Something's yeah. wrong with you. Right. And so similar it, to our prison system. Yeah. Where we right. don't treat the problem. Instead we treat the symptom. Correct. I feel like we could say that's true. Yeah, 90% of the time. Culturally, right it now. It is. Right, we just want to kind of treat the symptom. And yeah. I think one of the things that this study also shows and what research is coming out is all those protective factors that when these kids get a consistent, stable relationship, and it could be in the form of a coach mm -hmm. or a teacher or a neighbor, it's just somebody who provides a consistent nurturing and protective presence goes so far. This research that came out that showed a pro-maternal nurturing behavior that rat moms mm -hmm. lick the rat babies at birth. And part of the licking is they produce this protein and this is a really protective protein and those babies grow up to live <laughs> amazing rat lives. Yeah. <laughs> they have really good coping skills yeah. and their ability to regulate stress oh, is interesting. It's really great. Yeah. And then the rats that don't get licked and don't get nurtured very early on go to show anxiety and oh. act out in aggression and all the things that we would expect to see without that nurturance. Yeah. But the thing is that they showed is that even those pups that didn't get it, if they did get that nurturance later in life, they were still able to produce that protein, right? Okay. So even if you don't get it from the very beginning, this is good news. This is good news. <laughs> I know. I feel like so far, so much of this isn't good news. Well, no, but we have to learn. I feel mm -hmm. like in order to make things better, we have to learn what's it's like, you can't fix something if you don't know how it's broken. Exactly. And I think so. you have to look under the hood and kind of assess the whole thing exactly. instead of the patch job along the way. Yeah. Which is what we were just talking. We're doing patch right. jobs when we're treating symptoms. A lot okay. Of so now jobs. we know this is that, you know, if they this don't get nurturance, they can act out in bad ways, but anytime you can get nurturance later in life, right. It doesn't mean that you can't still be loving, communicative, connecting, right. all of the things that you know or other it, people might and have. And if you didn't get it and you are in a caregiving position, you, there's so many places you can go to get those skills. Because I think yeah. so many people are like, but I didn't have that. I don't know how to give that. Thank God we live in the time we live right now. It's not that difficult to find yeah. a way to receive, to learn how to, to provide. Totally. It. I used to, um, for those of you who don't know, one of my first jobs before I even went to graduate school to see if I really enjoyed counseling and wanted to be in the therapy realm, mm -hmm. I worked at this parenting um, teen girl foster home. It was a lot, but I taught parenting classes there mm -hmm. because a lot of them didn't have nurturing parents or any parents around in general. Some of them mm -hmm. were, lived on the streets. Um, and so there are tons of resources and ways to learn 
parenting skills and nurturing and communication strategies. I mean, therapists like us um, and counselors and even at schools, there's groups and there's always different ways. Even online, you can take courses and you can learn. That's the really cool thing is there are resources. I think the other thing that comes up when you say that is I think sometimes we discount our reach that you know, as an adult, if you have children in your life, even if they're not your children, is to really understand the significance of your own presence. That our reach, being a present other for a kid that might be struggling, is is so great. And I think sometimes we don't have that awareness to realize the um, implications of like those kinds of gestures. Yeah. When I work with clients, so often I'll ask you know, if they've had a ton of childhood trauma, you know, who were your surrogates? Because we all, mm. we find some substitutions along the way. Yeah. And what like I find- Like the good enough mother. Exactly. That yeah. come in the form of a coach or a counselor of some kind. Or, or a friend's parent. I had a client right. who found a friend's family, almost like the surrogate family. Mm -hmm. And that she felt helped her graduate high school. Exactly. It's like that resource. And I yeah. find the, the resilience in in the people I work with are often the people that kind of, they don't even know why they're looking for it or how they found it, but they knew they needed to find health. Yeah. If their parents couldn't give it to them. Well, and isn't, I, I don't know, like, I always feel like, good job brain and body, because <laughs> it's like, we could have come out of like a really bad situation, but we're resourceful. Exactly. We reach out. Right. And I think that like discrediting that is doing you a disservice for like all of the strength and resiliency that we innately have. And I think that's like, I said good enough mother because there was a study like, I don't know, in the 50s? It could not be done now, and I really, like, let's not get into the ethics of it, but it was these monkeys that they took away from their mothers too early, and some got, like, a, a wire framed with a little bit of cotton batting, and that was the good enough mother, and they would hold on to the good enough mother. Mm -hmm. And so I say that because sometimes, even if it's not this perfect person who's very nurturing, we'll take what we can get, mm -hmm. and we'll reach out to find what fills the void. And that's, that's really great. That means we can heal and we can grow. Yay. Exactly. It is good news. Yeah. <laughs> it is the good news. I think when you, it's like the antidote, one of the antidotes I'd say is human connection. Yeah. It could come in the form of our communities in faith. Yeah. In, you know, um, religious gatherings. I think that's what they're really showing. And I think intuitively when you said that, it makes a lot of sense that we, when we can start using that attachment system and starting to trust the world again, because that's yeah. one of the implications of childhood trauma is a world's not really a safe place. Well, that's what our experience has been. Right. You know, and it is adaptive in the same way our brain can be adaptive, right. you know, for good or for bad, right? It protects us. It's like, don't trust adults. Adults have hurt mm -hmm. us. All adults are not safe. And that's a nice segue into why I wanted to have you here today and why I picked this particular topic. About two weeks ago, YouTube reached out to me and asked if I would come to a screening of a documentary um, that they were part of. And it's called The Price of Free. And it comes out on YouTube. You can watch it on the 27th of November. I would encourage you to do so. It'll be on Soul Pancake's channel. But the whole documentary is about, uh, it follows this guy Kailash Satyati, who is working to end child slavery. And the thing that struck me about the video, obviously the whole documentary is heartbreaking um, because they're finding these children working for little to no money for 16 hours a day, um, you know, and they don't get to go to school, they don't get to have a childhood essentially. And it was really hard for me to watch. And I was curious about the mental health ramifications because that's what made me think of it when you said like, not feeling like the world is a safe place. Mm -hmm. When they get these boys out of these horrible working environments, they won't make eye contact. Um, they don't want to touch the adults at all. They, they huddle together the children, mm. um, because probably those were the only people that were there and were safe. And I was just really wanting to get into the ramifications of child slavery and why it is so important that we work together to end it. And while watching this documentary, when they go to rescue the children, essentially, there are signs of emotional abuse, physical abuse, neglect, and it's just, it's really difficult to watch and you really feel for these kids. And it just led me down this, you know, rabbit hole as any therapist, I'm sure, but like, what are the ramifications of this long term? Not only for the children in the moment, because that's what the Kailash Foundation does is they rescue them and they take care of any physical ailments and they, they love them and they nurture them and they give them food and understanding, but how, what's the trickle down from this if when they grow up, 
to have children of their own. And that's why I wanted to talk more about like how this can affect them later in life and even affect their own children. So based on kind of what we know and the fact that trauma can trickle down and it can affect us later in life, that's what research really shows, I would assume then the best way to combat that would be early intervention, right? Right, that the earlier you get uh, a child, those particular sensitive periods of development where the brain has access to all the nourishment, whether it's through food or emotional nourishment and support, yeah. the better. And so then if we want to intervene earlier, my guess would be in the way that I tell my teenage patients, mm -hmm. it's their friends that are the first line. Mm -hmm. When we're younger, it'd probably be teachers, coaches, pediatricians, yeah. neighbors. I think one of the things that I really learned through my patients and through my research is that I think a lot of adults are afraid to ask or friends are afraid to ask. Yeah. They might think or suspect something's going on, but you know, I don't want to make the other person uncomfortable. Well, and I always <laughs> think it's interesting you say that because I talk about that when it comes to suicidality and asking, it's okay to ask someone if they're mm -hmm. suicidal. You're not going to cause them to be suicidal. Right. And when people are like, well, I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I'm like, no, you're uncomfortable, mm, you I like know? That. And I think it's okay to be uncomfortable because the other option is it going unnoticed and untreated. Exactly, right? I think that's what we've really been outlining today is unnoticed and untreated leads to like a whole trickle down of kind of horrible, potentially yeah. horrible things. Physical and mental. And mental, right, for many generations. So the risk of asking is short-term discomfort for long-term gain. So definitely we should encourage those around us. If we see it, we should say something essentially. And we talked a little bit about the symptoms like children acting out. Is that pretty much what, if you are a teacher or a coach or a parent that you're, you have a play date with another child and you notice mm -hmm. things, is that what they should look for is just yeah, acting out I think bit? acting out or acting in. I think mm. it's sometimes a kid that's really withdrawn and seems really tuned out and not able to focus but maybe not ringing any bells. Yeah, because it doesn't. It's not always these huge actions. It can a lot of times be like in the the documentary Price of Free, like the lack of eye contact, mm -hmm. the struggle, and not wanting the the movements when someone would try to touch mm -hmm. them. It was like a defense. I felt like it was fight or flight mm -hmm. constantly that um, response. Mm -hmm. And so if you notice anything like that. Don't be afraid to speak up. It, it's not going to make anything worse. Yes, it might be a little uncomfortable for that little bit, but like Alexa said, that's like long-term gain. We're looking not only for their lifetime, but the generations to follow. Mm -hmm. So if you are that teacher, that coach, um, or that other parent, how do you ask? What is the best way to approach a, a child potentially and ask them you know, what's going on? Exactly, because I think one of the, the, the biggest obstacles is you're not gonna necessarily sit down and say, hey, are you being abused at home? Yeah, because right? children, I mean, often, especially if it's still happening, they're too scared to say anything or speak up, especially to adults. Like we said, adults might not be safe. Right, right. So you might wanna just start by asking, hey, how are you? Mm -hmm. Just an inquiry, a sit down, a real deep inquiry. How are things going? This is what I'm noticing. This has been a big change in your behavior. So I would start with like, what's observable first? and just stick with like, this is what I'm seeing, I'm trying to understand what's going on. And I would start to just ask little things like, hey, are you able to sleep at night? Do you have mm. nightmares? Oh yeah. You know, are you able to eat? Do you feel like you could just start asking more about the symptoms versus the content? Yeah. So they can just start talking and then say like, you know, sometimes scary things happen. Is there anything scary going on right now? Mm. I would start, general and then you can get more specific. Yeah, as they open up a little bit more and exactly. kind of build a relationship. A relationship. Yeah. And and you can talk about why you're a safe person, that you're here to protect them and that you care about them and that you've always cared about them if that if you have a long-term relationship with the person and that the reason you're asking these questions is because you really want to help. Yeah. Well, I think that's really great that because a lot of like when I was watching the documentary, a lot of it was like, I don't even know how to, how do you speak up? How do you ask? How do you, we need to often feel like we have to have actions we can take and things we can do. Um, and something wonderful that you can do today is you can donate to the Kailash Foundation and join Alexa and I as we support Kailash in his efforts to end child slavery. And you can do that by clicking the blue donate button. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your expertise. It's so incredibly helpful. And 
please come back again. <laughs> <laughs> and please watch The Price of Free. Um, it's a documentary, again, it comes out November 27th on Soul Pancakes channel. I will link their channel in the description. Please check it out, it's really important. And again, please donate to the Kailash Foundation. They are doing great things and every child deserves a childhood. So click that blue donate button and donate now. And I will see you next time. Bye.